Hi, my name is Dr. Rich Miller and I'm the Fish Vet. In this next video, we're showing you a revisit of a client where we had initial skin ulcer for we were suspecting due to traumatic injury and low pH. In this video, I will appear a little bit more nervous uh, than usual and that's because I was dealing with a really stressful situation where there were fish dying and presenting with a lot of ulcers. I even had to go to the Perth International Airport to collect a special delivery of antibiotics to help save these fish's lives. Okay, so we have a problem at our previous owner's house. We thought that we just had one fish with a skin ulcer. We treated that one symptomatically, corrected the pH, but now the rest of the fish are looking pretty ill. Um, we've done a water quality test. So here are the previous water, and this is the one currently. Uh, basically, there's no significant difference. The ammonia nitrite are zero. The pH sitting at about seven to seven and a half. And the carbonate hardness, the alkalinity, I guess the previous water had only two degrees, whereas the current one has four degrees. So um, definitely something's eating away at the alkalinity, um, whether that could be a cause, possibly the bacteria uh, build up. Um, or possibly the pH, the acidity of it has damaged the skin somewhat and then we've got secondary bacterial infections causing ulcers in multiple fish now. Skin ulcers can happen due to many reasons. I've seen cases where, yeah, I guess from pH, um, also nitrite toxicity and also um, bacterial and ectoparasitic diseases uh, leading to secondary bacterial infections. However, it's really hard to dif distinguish between a pure bacterial infection and something that was previously caused by something else that's now presenting as a bacterial infection because basically they're swimming in a soup of bacteria. Um, any sort of skin damage they get, whether it be from being attacked or water quality issues, or ectoparasitic um, irritation, uh, they, they tend to be just colonized by bacteria anyway. So um, in terms of uh, what's causing it um, for this particular time, I would say it's due to pH being acidic. Okay, so I had to go to the airport, I guess, to make a super special um, express order for this drug called Convenia. Uh, it's quite a convenient drug so it comes in this huge box. So we'll just open it up and try and look for our drug. Let's see where it is. Um, it really needs to be kept cold. Basically it loses its efficacy once it's cold anymore. Here it is, it has a lot of packaging and ice. Um, yeah, just to keep it chilled. All right, so. Now, what we have to do is we need to reconstitute the drug. Comes as two things, there's the powder, and here's the diluent, or the thing for mixing. So let's see, what is it? 10 mils into here. Once it's reconstituted, it can be kept in the fridge for about two months. It's got a 10 mil syringe. Pump some air into it so that's easier to take out the diluent. Right. And when we uh, mix it in here, basically you have to do it uh, pretty hard. I guess it's already got vacuum in it, so you can see as soon as you push the syringe in, you should actually suck it down. And just shake it along the way. So 
so for this you want to be using it at about 8 to 16 milligrams per kilogram body weight all right so next I'm just gonna make up the anesthetic bar so that we can give the fish a good check over plus weigh them so that we can give them accurate dosing of their medicine okay for the anesthetic what we're going to use is alfaxalone which is used as a small animal anesthetic right let that mix around a little bit and we'll get our first patient uh, we're going to start off with the ones that are least affected and then we'll move on to the ones that are most severely affected and then the cohawk well, this net is a little small, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to trap him and then use the koi sock to transfer him. Now, um, if you have a look here, so it looks like he's in a bit of a bloodbath. Um, this can sometimes happen where there's spontaneous bleeding through the gills. Nobody really knows what causes it. Could be changes in, I guess, the, the blood pressure um, in the fish which is normally supported by the I guess the weight of the water uh, once you take him out uh, into the sort of air you don't have the sort of resistant resistance of the water sort of pushing back on the gills so um, this can happen from time to time basically you just put them straight into back into the water um, they should the blood should clot um, just in no time at all yeah in the meantime can see our koi uh, sort of a bit quite sedated. It's our little silver one. You can see it doesn't have any lesions at all. We'll check out uh, this other silver one. Wow. This mouth really is a bit swollen and red. Yeah, it's not quite at least sedated enough. It's probably still at the sort of excitatory phase. And our large koi, he's still got his writing reflex. So we'll leave him in a little bit longer. And now for the transfer. He might be a splash. Oh no, we've got a goldfish in with him. Just make sure he doesn't get whacked by our big koi. Okay, well, since we've got the goldfish, we should give him a checkup as well. Uh, one thing uh, we mentioned before with the low pH and the acidity, it should kill all the parasites. Um, so we'll do it our gill biopsy and skin mucus scrape and, and see how, how we go, whether the low pH did indeed uh, kill off all those parasites. So it seems like we have to operate pretty quickly. Uh, we'll just put a net there just for safekeeping. You seem to have to have eyes behind your head. And I guess with this filming, I can have eyes behind my head just looking at the camera. All right, so I've got my scissors, cover slip, and slides ready, microscope ready. Uh, Battery is fully charged, so that's good. Oh. Nice color. Just give me the spray. Okay, so here's our little slide. We'll put it down under the microscope. Here we go, the microscope there, and we'll see what we find. So yeah, in terms of external parasites, I think the coast is clear. The low pH did would have gotten rid of any sorts of external parasites. Here's our little cute little goldfish. He's, thankfully he is safe. Um, yes. yeah, it's perfect all over. Beautiful. He can go back to his home. Okay, so our big guy, that's, um, looks like he's lost his writing reflex a little bit. 
so we can really examine him closely. Uh, one of the things you want to check is the ventrum, the bottom part of the fish, which we rarely see because fish, these koi tend to live in ponds without um, glass sides, so you're not able to see them all over. We'll check this other side. Actually, if we have a closer look at this girl, um, she actually has a lesion right on the, at the base of her pectoral fin. Right, because he's a very valuable fish um, in the midst of all this ulcer disease, what we want to do is we want to make sure that nothing bad happens to him or her. Nothing bad happens to her. So we're going to give her the antibiotic injection um, subcutaneously. Now with our cohawk, you can see there's a little bit of redness just right here where my thumb is. And basically nowhere else. Uh, the owner did see, uh, I guess there, there were three deaths already in this pond. Uh, one was a goldfish, two were koi, one had ulcers on it, and the other one had no physical or clinical uh, gross signs of disease. So um, we have to be very careful. Um, we want to just stamp out any diseases from here on onwards. So um, this little kohak, he him with his tiny little redness, um, we, we need to treat that with caution. Uh, we will try and we will treat that with antibiotics as well. Alright, so I um, guess you can see this guy here, <clears throat> the base of his pelvic fins. It's definitely really red, a term we use hyperemic. And then if we move further south down to his anal fin. You can see it's a bit red there, and this guy here, his anal fin's really eaten away. Uh, it's looking really red and raw. So definitely need to give these guys our injections. You can see his, his mouth is also very red. It's really bad. Remember this girl from before you can see the ulcer sort of semi healed in parts but in some parts look a bit worse for wear um, so we'll do we'll just clean that up a little bit more and then leave it to heal we should should be fine this time okay so what I'm going to do because I'm working on my own and just blew up this um, Ziploc bag just a tiny bit. You can see there's a bit of hair in there. I'm just going to use this as a sling to hold our fish out of the water. Okay, you can sort of see it's working. Uh, it's a bit of a new invention here. So I've got the Ziploc bag tucked under the pel pectoral fins uh, on the underside. A little bit of air on each side and a bit of water and uh, sort of sitting up there uh, ready for me to so attack the little ulcer there so okay so here is the ulcer now I've basically removed any bits that can form pockets um, that way you don't get any underrunning of the bacteria infection basically that's uh, the bits that we've removed from him uh, the next thing we want to do is we want to just put some topical antiseptic and then this fish is ready to go back. Okay, here is our fish. Let's just turn him to the side. You can see, uh, wow, this has really gone really deep underneath the scales there and another more minor lesion further back over here and then another one at the caudal peduncle ventral part so this is looking really severe you can see the necrosis here okay so what we'll do we'll use our rat's tooth forceps
If you have a close look at these, these are called rat's tooth forceps and they're really good to stop the the scales from slipping. You can just really grip them really hard and then pull them out sort of in the direction that they're growing. Um, that way you cause least damage to the skin. This sort of procedure is going to be painful for the fish so we have them under anesthesia. The anesthetic again that we're using here is alfaxalone and we use about 6 mils in about 30 liters of water just to get the sedation you need. We have to top up the anesthetic a little bit. We use another 1.5 mils uh, because it just gets consumed over time with the number of fish that we're adding into it. Um, again, sincere apologies, I won't be able to film that. Um, I'm just here working alone. Um, just have to imagine or watch our other videos on how we have to remove all the scales uh, that are affected. Um, and then also uh, debride with a scalpel blade. If there's any bleeding, we use electrocautery to stop the bleed. We can also use potassium permanganate soaked swabs onto the blood vessel. So here is our sling again, making use of the sling, basically just touching any part of these scales. That is associated, closely associated with the lesion. We're just going to grab it with our rats with forceps and just give it a quick tug backwards. And so you can see the tissues here are quite swollen. So maybe I think that one is okay, but uh, we should just get a nice clear margin. Um, sometimes when you're plucking these scales, you can in introduce gas into the underneath the scale pocket. So you want to smooth it over, make sure no gas gets trapped underneath. Okay, good. Next we will... These are special scissors to just resect all the dead tissue from our fish. Sorry. Okay, so basically this is everything we've taken out of our patient here and you can see it's got a nice clean wound bed um, we can see right in the center this one here is actually exposed muscle you can actually see the muscle which is, means it's a very very deep ulcer um, this is the I guess the sort of deep connective tissue, the dermal layer. Uh, all the epithelium is gone, we've removed all the scales and you can see a nice red vascular bed. It'll bring all the immune cells to help fight the bacterial infection. So next what we're going to do is we're going to give it some um, topical antibiotics with our fish bandage. So initially we've got this so it's a mixture of anrofloxacin antibiotic with a bit of water. Just give that a flush initially and then we'll go with our fish bandage. It adheres to the skin and the powder will also absorb the antibiotic mixture and hold it there where it's needed. So we're just going to soak that powder and it'll form a sort of a protective slime as well. Uh, it's a slimy substance. So we're just going to do this part of the fish and then we're going to do the sort of the dorsal aspect of the ulcer after later on. Okay, just um, waking up our patient near the aeration this way you can get a speedier recovery we've done the same thing down here sorry we didn't film that but basically it's yeah same debriding you can see his ventilation 
ventilating by himself so he's going to come out of it at this stage you, you can leave him on the pond floor to recover by himself but it's a very large fish so we don't want him to sort of get too disoriented and smack himself around now that all fish have recovered from the anesthesia then over the next few days we have to monitor that they regain the appetite and that their skin lesions are healing the important lessons we can take from this experience is just how quickly your pH can drop without you even knowing it and how deadly it can be to your fish regular water testing and having adequate buffers in your system can help prevent your pH from crashing commonly used slow release buffers such as crushed coral limestone or shells can be used to counteract any unexpected nutrient overload in your system nutrient overload can happen when for example if a fish has died and is stuck behind a rock without you knowing it or if there's a, a whole heap of uneaten food collecting in a place where you're unaware of you have to be extra vigilant especially during springtime when it's breeding season and in this situation where you have large koi in a relatively small body of water the fish can expel large amounts of reproductive fluid which can lead to a pH crash and not only that but also the nutrient release can lead to bacterial proliferation to dangerous levels you have to watch your stocking density and I can't stress enough that you have to check not only your pH but also your KH your carbonate hardness or alkalinity and the reason for this is you think about the weather forecast your alkalinity can predict what is going to happen to your pH in most ponds you have to have at least 4 degrees of carbonate hardness or equivalent of between 60 to 80 milligrams per liter or 60 to 80 parts per million of carbonate hardness it's been about 10 days since our visit and I've had a conversation with the owner recently and he's glad to report that the fish are now eating and behaving normally which are really great indicators that the fish are on the road to recovery i'll hope to get you some of that footage of the fish recovered in one of our future videos so until then thank you for watching make sure you subscribe to get updates of our future videos and have a fantastic week